afternoon, depending on where you are. And welcome to Intuitive's second Global Perspectives event of the year. I'd like first to welcome today's panelists. We have Jennifer Cover, President and CEO of Woodworks. Kevin Naranjo, National Wood Innovations Project Manager for the U.S. Forest Service. Reza Farimani, VP of Construction with Heinz. Tim Gockman, Managing Director of New Land Enterprises. Uh, and myself, I'm Tanya Luthi. I'm a structural engineer and vice president at Intuitive in our New York office. And I'll be wearing two hats today as both panelist and moderator. Um, so please submit questions in the chat. We will get to as many as we can at the end of the panel discussion. Um, there will be a link to each of our kind of standard bios in the chat. So we welcome you to read those if you haven't already. Uh, and in lieu of more standard introductions, we're gonna start off with a quick go around the table uh, or the screen in this case. Um, and we've asked each panelist to give us uh, a one minute version of uh, their timber story. So what motivated them to get involved in timber? Um, and so maybe I'll, maybe I'll go first to kick us off. So for me, I got my introduction to mass timber about 10 years ago, working on a project in Vancouver where I lived at the time. Uh, and initially I liked it for two reasons. First, I'm very easily bored and it was different. Uh, and second, most structural engineers, we really hate when our work gets covered up with finishes and in a timber building, uh, it's much more likely to stay exposed because it's beautiful. Um, but over time, over these last 10 years, uh, the sustainability aspects of mass timber have um, really taken forefront and given me a very strong sense of purpose to what I do. And that's always been important to me. So um, I really wanna push for change. Um, I think the status quo is really not where we need to be. So. So that's my timber story, uh, and I'm just gonna kind of go around uh, my screen. So, um, Kevin, how about you? I th thank you, Tanya. So uh, the, the Forest Service has been looking at mass timber for probably um, about eight, eight, eight years, but I was first exposed to it uh, three years ago when I took, took the, the, this position with the Forest Service. And my background uh, is construction and uh, construction management, so I'm, I'm familiar with buildings. I, I think mass timber is, is just way cool because it does so many great things. Uh, you, you, it helps us right, to, to reduce the, our carbon footprint right, in the environment, but it also allows us to be able to do uh, positive work on the ground and, and improve the condition and the health of our forest. So I, I, I'm all in on mass timber. I think it's great. Thanks, Kevin. Next on my screen is Reza. Uh, uh, well, my exposure was similar to actually Kevin. It was about three years ago through one of the highest T3 project in Atlanta. They, they invite us uh, to be in that project. And believe me or not, the first thing actually kind of catch my attention to wood was the smell. Because we had this dinner there and this smell of the wood is everywhere. It was enchanting and, and, and they kind of fall in love with the whole idea. And obviously the look is really tranquilizing, like going to this building compared to any other like office building, which is a kind of cold, but you see the wood, it's like feel homey and all these things. And then I uh, came up, obviously I'm in the New York base. We're, we're pushing to use it in, in Manhattan and then we're working right now on that. And that, that's just, uh, you know, continue and uh, connect with the intuitive and Tony on that. So we're working on it right now. Hopefully we're gonna have office building here at the high rise. Great, thanks, Jennifer. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to be here today. Um, yeah, I first got involved with timber back in grad school at UC Berkeley. Uh, it was one of the first structural material courses where the professor actually talked about how our material choice could impact the environment. Focus back then was just renewability. There wasn't a big discussion about carbon then, <laughs> but it was one of the you know, that whole concept of the fact that we could grow a material that we could then use to build our cities with that was renewable and sustainable, like just really resonated with me. And so when I got out of grad school, I'm a structural engineer by trade. Um, I started working for KPFF structural engineers and there um, I became the junior engineer who was in charge of everything wood. So I did a lot of wood design there and then just continued down that path. And now I get to teach others um, on how to design with wood. So it's been fun. That's great. All right, Tim, wrap us up. Okay. All right. Uh, well, our first exposure, uh, my first exposure to mass timber, um, I think in the way that we're talking about was in 2017, uh, when I saw the case study for River Beach Tower. But the benefit of living in a port city like Milwaukee is that heavy timber is all around us. Um, so intuitively, I understood the draw to the 
uh, what we now is called the biophilic aspects of it, but at the time it was just aesthetics. Um, but as we you know, got into the design of Ascent and now as we've been through the construction uh, process, we've understood all of the other benefits, the speed, the precision, the smaller labor force, um, the cleaner environment, and really, I think, uh, the de-risking of the entire construction process. Um, and so, yes, I, for all of those reasons, I strongly, strongly believe that mass timber is going to do for the construction industry what steel did 100 years ago, transforming the way that we design and build buildings and we see what's possible. And so uh, very exciting, very exciting to talk about this. That's great. So I, I would like to spend most of today's discussion talking about the future, but before we do that, I think it is helpful to talk a little bit about the present. So where are we today in terms of mass timber construction? Um, I'm gonna hand it over to Jennifer first to give a bit of an overview. Um, and then I'd like each panelist, if, if everyone could comment from your perspective on what you're seeing right now um, in your role and how it relates to this overall picture that Jennifer uh, will paint for us here. So Jennifer. Perfect. Thank you, Tanya. So um, I lead a program that's a nonprofit and we provide continuing education and assistance to architects and engineers trying to work in this space. So that's why I'm kind of the one addressing this topic, because we do work throughout the entire U.S. And we have folks all over the country that are providing assistance on these projects. We're staffed mostly with architects and engineers. Uh, this is a map, though, of the current state of mass timber projects throughout the country. So there's about 1,300 projects that have either uh, been constructed or in design. So this gives you a general idea of where it's at around the country. The blue is what where construction has started or those projects have been built. And the gray is what's in design. So what's pretty exciting about this, I think, this next map is a fun one because it um, shows you how it builds over time. And really the first CLT building was built in the US back in 2011. And then we held the first CLT symposium back in 2013. So that's really just 11 years ago from when the first building was built. And now we're looking at, there's 642 that have been built, another 742 that are in design. So that's how we get to that 1300 number. So watching this grow over time has been really exciting and um, seeing it take off. It's just been incredible to watch the interest in this space. What I do find really interesting as we talk about today, you know, what the hurdles are and some of the things we're looking at, um, you know, this makes it, you know, when you look at this map, you're like, wow, this has really taken off and is exciting. What I think is really exciting is that there's actually 17,000 buildings that are built every single year that could be built with mass timber or wood solution, but currently are not. So by code, so these aren't ones that by code could not be built. These are all buildings that by code could be done with a wood solution that currently are not. And these are kind of the key markets that they're in. The gray is what could be wood. The green is what currently is in each of those key markets. And what's really interesting about this is if you go back to that map where you know the growth over time, that's still only 50 to 100 buildings being built a year out of mass timber. So we really are at the very beginning of this and to kind of Tim's point early on that you know this could be a huge transformation um, and just amazing opportunity here in front of us to um, change the way we build and really have a huge impact on the environment. So that's kind of where we're at, Tanya. Thanks. Um, so next, actually, Kevin, I'd like to turn it over to you. And if you could, I think it would be helpful for our audience if you just want to take a couple of minutes to talk generally about the role the Forest Service plays in the mass timber world. I think a lot of people know what developers and designers do, um, but I suspect um, many folks listening are less familiar with the Forest Service and the many ways that it supports this industry. Sure. So uh, I, I, I am. I work in our Washington office and, and the group that I work in is, um, is Wood Innovations. And so, uh, so it's part of the state and private forestry. And what we have been doing since roughly about 2014 has been trying to uh, help uh, stimulate or, or uh, through strategic investment. Uh, since 2014, the Forest Service has funded close to $40 million in uh, funding to be able to uh, for, uh, related to mass timber. Uh, so we're trying to identify strategic investments that, in, that can include through our, uh, we have a competitive grant program um, and each year we fund at least 20, 25, um, whether that's some kind of research or, or actual buildings um, related to mass timber. Um, so we're, we're trying to help grow that market. 
uh, we, we provide uh, and help support uh, the, the work that Woodworks does uh, along with the, the Softwood Lumber Board. Um, we, we have, um, we've, we've trying to initiate some, we, uh, 20, 2015, we did a tall timber contest to try and bring highlight mass timber in the US. And then in 2019, we did a, a competitive uh, contest with universities. And there were 10 universities across the country that, um, that, that were successful in, in getting a grant from us to really kind of help them build, uh, highlight and promote mass timber. And then just uh, recently, we partnered with uh, the Software Lumber Board and, and Woodworks was, again, a strategic partner on that for the education piece. Uh, we've, we, we, a mass timber competition. Uh, and I think those uh, announcements will get announced uh, next week at the AA conference, the winners of that. So we're really trying to, um, our role is to be able to work with architects, engineers, developers, uh, universities, uh, other partners to try and, uh, uh, like I say, create strategic investment, look for opportunities to help grow uh, mass timber as a market, whether that's education, whether that's research, uh, whether that's a building itself, uh, just to just to uh, up make that give that exposure. Thanks. Sure, uh, Reza, where where do you see us today? So, at, obviously, at Heinz, I'm looking at the project we are under the development. At approximately, I would say currently there is a good number of a uh, handful of uh, projects uh, that you saw in that slide. The first slide you show that is under the uh, design or construction, which is significant compared to a few years ago. It's like uh, at least 11 or maybe 15. Uh, and uh, there's a good number of them in North America and there's stuff, uh, there, there are buildings in, in Europe uh, that we are developing with the mass timber, um, which is probably it's 10% or something of the entire development that we have uh, worldwide. So um, I understand that the, but what I see is like mostly are com commercial, not other sectors. I mean, at least the one I see is more for, for a reason, I guess, that more may be appealing at this time uh, than the uh, other sectors of the uh, 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 development. Uh, uh, there is a good uh, incentive or push that I see at, at, at my area, that which is New York City. And I, I, I see it actually every day that like a few weeks ago, there is a, a commercial building, it's a big one that I can't just say that because of the confidentiality. They are pushing through uh, the city and then the state and also private sectors that they like this, this appealing to the tenants. So I, I see very good, good future. And then obviously we have obstacles at the code level, especially fire. And in a big city like uh, New York City, or the, with the high rise stuff, uh, that uh, we've got to like that we have challenges that we should overcome with these uh, materials. And I, I guess uh, the, the turn of century, the, they were using more mass timber or the bulk things, as 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 Tim said, especially in the poor city like here, but still came and then overtake that. But now we're kind of reversing back. I mean, our competition is more concrete. Here right now, but uh, to take back, I think we gotta take those challenges. Like fire is one of them. Availability of materials, another one. We, we are limited on the uh, supply of the uh, mass timber currently, especially in U.S. Yeah, and, and, and I understand there's uh, one of the things in you know, on the East Coast. They suggest us to bring stuff even from Europe. Uh, so those are the challenges we have, but we we get a very good. Uh, demands or, or interest at least in the market that so we see that. Thanks. Tim. And Raz, I want to, you know, I want to just confirm it. For us, what we see as the supply constraint is not the raw material, but it's just the production capacity. Right? Okay. Um, so I, the way that I see it, and, and Jennifer's heard me make this comparison so many times, um, I think that we are in the very, very early stages and on the cusp of a mass timber revolution. Um, and I compare mass timber a lot to Tesla, right? So go back however many years when Tesla released its Roadster and the Roadster was really cool and really exciting. And the vast majority of people still didn't believe that it was a viable product, right? And then Tesla releases the uh, SUV, the Model X. 
right? And a bunch, bunch, a bigger, much bigger section of the market says, okay, well, that's kind of compelling, but we still don't see this as a as a big sector of the market. 99% of vehicles will still be internal combustion engine. Fast forward to today, and the vast majority of car manufacturers have now made plans to either completely convert or at least partially convert to electric vehicles. It is the same thing for mass timber. What's exciting about mass timber is that this isn't a movement that's like driven by hippies, right? Or, or a niche uh, section of the market. This is a movement that's embraced across multiple industries, multiple companies in different sectors. We're talking not just Heinz, which is an amazing development firm and uh, in and of itself speaks volumes about what the true potential of mass timber is, but also Brookfield and Lendlease, um, among other developers are embracing this, but it's not just real estate developers. Microsoft, Google, which has spun off Sidewalk Labs into a specific mass timber direction. Um, uh, uh, Adidas, the new headquarters that we saw in Portland is mass timber, right? Robinhood moved into a mass timber building. T3 that Heinz built in Minneapolis is occupied by Amazon. And then of course, Walmart, which is building an entire new campus, over 2 million square feet, purely out of mass timber and has taken a uh, position, has taken uh, an investment into structural land. And now you have Canadian manufacturers moving into the United States. So you've got mass timber spreading in so many different ways from a manufacturing capacity, from uh, an adoption standpoint. And yet it is still so early as we see it in the industry. And so to Jennifer's point about how many buildings are built that could be built out of wood, that's the market size. When private equity looks at the potential capacity of the market, that's the market size. And so I think we've got a long way to go, but we've made some really amazing progress. Yeah. Yeah, I feel uh, similar from the from the consulting engineer perspective. I would echo a lot of what I heard from all of you. I mean, we, at the very beginning, it was, you know, a lot of institutional or what I would call very mission driven private organizations. And the way that I we have seen that kind of spread of the interest that we're getting, um, you know, kind of as Tim said, it's really now kind of coming from everywhere. Um, and, you know, the growth of the supply, even the growth of the supply chain, I do, you know, I, I think we have a long way to go, but even compared to where we were 10 years ago, right, we're not where Europe is, but it's a very different situation than we had, you know, a decade ago. Um, you know, COVID has been a bit of a bumpy ride, but that's for everyone, not just for timber. So, um, and, and then also if I take off my designer hat for a moment, I put my code committee hat on, I'm on the New York City code committee and uh, was involved a little bit in the, some of the work groups that helped uh, with the IBC changes that came in 2021. I mean, there's um, a lot of really rapid development, which is very heartening, but it's still, um, it's still a challenge for the codes to keep up. It's just inherently a slow process. Um, you know, on purpose, because it needs to be deliberative and have a lot of input, so it, it can't quite keep up with um, the pace that um, that we're going in terms of mass timber and those developments. So that's a bit of a challenge. Um, and then just also a very wide range of, of appetite is what I see in different jurisdictions for, um, you know, if you do want to go outside the prescriptive code. So that's kind of where I, where I see things from my perspective right now. Um, and so if we kind of shift for a moment and talk a little bit about the design of these buildings, um, you know, there's so many influences, constraints, um, competing interests and goals that go into building a building. I had a, a mentor, uh, a great mentor early in my career who always used to uh, kind of make this joke, I'm paraphrasing a bit, but you know, anytime there's a building that actually gets built, um, you know, that required at least four miracles along the way. And uh, so if you kind of think of all those things, you almost can think in terms of concentric circles, right? In the little circle, innermost circle that I work in, uh, you know, with the design team where, you know, we're thinking about the building codes, but also just general good design principles, right? And then you you kind of move out from that a little bit. And you're if you're a developer, you're thinking about your pro formas and you're thinking about financing and um, you know zoom go out again. You've got zoning laws that are kind of constraining you. And then you move out even further and you think about things like preferences and culture. You think of sort of the attitudes towards density in North America versus Europe, and kind of all these things that influence you know and are the reasons for why we build what we build. So I wonder if we could all kind of talk about one, either an important influence or a constraint that you see on the design of mass timber buildings that is either paving the way for mass timber to grow or you think would need to change for mass timber to be more than just this um, kind of small niche. And uh, 
So, you know, for me, uh, you know, again, since I live in that small circle at the beginning, maybe I'll start and I'll say um, the reluctance sometimes to start with timber and let that guide design decisions. Timber is a structural material. So, you know, people want the timber version of their steel and concrete or concrete building that they did last time around. And to me, I'm always making the argument that this is a different paradigm. I mean, for one thing with steel and concrete, you know, usually the goal is to make the structure as invisible as possible, right? You want as few columns as possible. You want the soffit high overhead um, and then trying to replicate that in timber doesn't make sense to me because it's beautiful. So why are we trying to hide it? You know, so, so maybe we do need a different column grid or we just need a different approach. So in that innermost circle, I do still see because we're so used to doing it a different way. Um, that's one of the things that I'm always trying to kind of push against, but um, be curious what others think again a constraint or an influence um that you think is a good thing or would need to change so maybe i'll hand it to uh reza first the, i mean i kind of touch base on the our, our constraint of challenge which is the fire one but i i'm not going to talk more well what i see i mean i understand the embodied carbon i understand the the appeal to the tenant because it's a beautiful material and all these things but what I see, actually, what I see as a strength of this material, and, and people talk about it, which I believe it might actually be one of the drivers uh, going forward, is the speed of construction. And if you look at the construction, the most of our times and, and the most of the volume are slab surfaces and then facade. So put the facade aside in the construction and the structure, columns and beams, and maybe shear wall. But the, but the slab is taking most of our times in a concrete building, especially. I put the form works and the rebars and then wait and then 28 days and this and that. And, and with the, all this uh, pressure that we have on the labor on the market, like the labor is a big challenge right now. Um, and we can import labors, right? Uh, from China or somewhere. So, and especially construction, the advantages of this CLT panel they have, you can put it quickly and it's pretty fast with the minimum labors. I think that I see as, as the advantage that if they actually move further with the lower cost, even, even the material itself might be a little bit more expensive. So that would, I would see that as opportunity of this timber that we should push for the new, new works and, and as, like, whatever it's like a multifamily or, or just, you know, whatever development is that, that's what I see that as actually opportunity here. Mm -hmm. Tim, how about you? So right to my earlier point about this movement not being driven by hippies, uh, uh, right, the reason is, is because there isn't a single, to me, there isn't a single influence as to what's driving this. It's that mass timber checks all the boxes. It's just a better way to build in the vast majority of situations. And so, um, right, I, I agree with Reza, it is, we've seen it. It's not just the speed of construction on the assembly of the frame, but because mass timber is 60% lighter, we spent literally half the time driving piles, right? Half the piles, half the depth. And the neighbors really appreciate that. The people really appreciate no hot works on the site because it's a lot, it's a much quieter site, both for the neighbors and for the for the teams on site. But to me, it still goes back to the very first thing that Raza mentioned, which is right, that people want this. At the end of the day, any consumer market, and this is a consumer market, there are end users for the things we all design and build, right? Any consumer market is driven by demand and by the consumer. And so at the end of the day, they don't care how we want to design things. They care about what they want. And therefore, we should care about what they want. And the message is very, very clear. No one walks into a building and is like, ooh, look at that amazing concrete. Look at that amazing, amazing, like exposed steel beam. I just generally, I mean, outside of like structural engineers, right? Um, <laughs> so, I do uh, that. <laughs> so, right, mo <laughs> most end users, um, most end users re react to wood. Once they see wood, they want to touch it, they, they smell it, they see it, and they want to know how it's built. It's like the food movement that started 10, 15, 20 years ago, where all of a sudden people said, well, where's my food coming from? I'm interested in this. Well, these are the conversations. We, we, we call ourselves construction technology agnostic. We've built in steel, we've built in concrete, we've built stick frame, we've built mass timber. The only times we have super engaging conversations with people who are end users of buildings are with mass timber. And so that tells you something, right? And when a consumer wants something, at the end of the day, the market gets there. 
And that I see as the biggest driver. And, the, and, the, and this is again, across all the entire spectrum of the industry. Office users want this. Heck, hospitals want this. Apartments certainly want this. Hotels are gonna want this. So that overwhelming demand uh, is what's gonna is what's gonna propel this movement forward, in my opinion. Jennifer and, or Kevin, anything you want to add to that on the constraints influence? Yeah, I mean, I would just build on on both the the key, they both hit on exactly what I think the main drivers are, and just even to further Tim's point, you know, the biophilic aspect of this, um, there was uh, a school owner um, representative. Um, that we were talking with. And she said that it was for a low income area, affordable. Uh, They're looking for affordable school and they had nine different architects bid, you know, come out and do a, a pitch for them. And she said eight of the nine gave them a vanilla box that that's all they could afford for this, you know, kind of lower income area. And that's all that it could be, you know, to her just looked very un, unimaginative, uninviting. And then one of the architects pitched a mass timber structure with it exposed and said, you know, you can use a structure itself to create this warm, welcoming feeling and also create an environment where you're educating these students about the benefits to the environment. And it was just a really interesting angle. And so, you know, without having to do a lot of bells and whistles, just using the structure itself to um, create that environment, I just thought was amazing. And so you know, they ended up winning winning the job. And um, so that in my mind was just, you know, again, to kind of build on on Tim's point around what is what the demand is. But I think even in in areas that you know, we're seeing it more in hospitals in um, medical office buildings, even light industrial, that's higher end where there's a warehouse where they want to have an environment where, you know, we get some higher end clients who are asking about, um, you know, light industrial, well, they're going to be working in that space and they want to attract um, you know, tech folks that are that really care about the environment and, and the space they work in. So at any rate, I just think that whole biophilic aspect um, is a huge driver in this space right now. And so Tanya, I just have a slightly different, uh, so I, I think um, our attention to climate change, right? Because we, we sort of attend, sort of ignored that. Um, the beauty of, of wood is, is as a, a superior, lo, a lo, lower embodied carbon than, than steel or concrete, right? So we're gonna be able to build buildings that have a, um, a, a, a lower carbon footprint. And a lot of cities are starting to think that way, right about lower, and, and I think the federal government now has made that commitment. Um, and, and then, but the, the, the other beauty of it is, if, if you look at the, that the health, I mean, I think we talk about sustainability, but the health of, our, of the forest in the US, uh, we really need to do management on those, right? So mass timber creates a market to be able to go in and do thinning and, and um, improve the health and reduce the risk of wildfire. Um, that, that, that's, that's the beauty of, of uh, I think, of being able to use wood because then we can, you know, we can replant, right? We can regrow trees and we do. Um, uh, we, we have a positive growth of, of, of trees in the U.S. right now. So I think that connection to climate change um, is going to be a driver for mass timber as we go forward. Yeah, you know, we got a lot of questions, sustainability and forestry related questions uh, when people submitted their questions in advance. So we're going to come back to that um, for a more detailed discussion in a moment. Just quickly before we do that um, on the design side, I want to touch briefly on uh, the height question. So um, it gets a lot of attention, um, tall mass timber, how tall uh, can we, should we go? Um, you know, you might be able to argue that, that uh, this whole question gets more attention than it deserves. Um, you know, but if, you, if people want to kind of talk from your perspective, how, how tall should we go? Is, is this whole question just a distraction from the goal of doing as much mass timber mid-rise as possible? You know, some people would argue, and I'm kind of in this camp as well, that, you know, there's a sweet spot for mass timber that's probably somewhere right now in that kind of five to 15 story range with a little buffer on either side. So um, anybody want to, I'm just going to open the floor. Anybody want to chime in here? Okay, I'll volunteer. Uh, so ascent is 25 stories, 284 feet, right? So plenty of buffer on top of your 15 that we're comfortable with. And our engineering is good up to uh, 410 feet, right, by code. So um, how tall can we go? Well, at least that tall. Um, and we're a mass timber hybrid. We've got a concrete podium and we've got concrete cores. Um, but clearly all over the world, they're, they're showing us we can go even taller. 
um, you know, at the end of the day, again, it, it's up to the, I think it's up to the end user. It's, you know, how tall do you want to go? Um, but the capacity to go tall is there and it, that will continue evolving. At the same time, I agree with you. I mean, it's, look, it gets a lot of focus because, because it does, uh, right? Tall buildings built out of wood are unusual. And so that gets everybody's attention. Like the Wall Street Journal is not writing about a six-story mass timber office building, even though maybe they should be, because that's far more impactful. Uh, but they are writing about 25-story. Fine, so be it. Um, write, write about the 25-story so that it encourages and uh, gives the ability for municipalities to change their codes and uh, build 26-story mass timber office buildings, which has, frankly, far more, far more impact. Uh, but yeah, the sweet spot, I agree with you. I, I would argue that it's up to 18, given the way that the code is written. Um, but yeah, I think the vast majority of buildings built in the United States fall into that range rather than the tall range. But overall, the answer is whatever you want it to be. Tony, do you want me to share the image of the, just sure. so people can see a quick summary yeah. of the different heights? Great. Yes. Yeah, I should have, when I, uh, five to 15, I was sort of saying for pure timber, definitely hybrid, you know, lots of opportunity to go taller right now with hybrid for sure. Right. And so uh, for those who uh, have not seen, so in the, in the 2021 IBC here in the States, I know we also have some folks in Canada um, and their code is a bit different, uh, which allows up to uh, what's sort of the equivalent of type 4B, which is that 12 story um, cap. But just to give folks this, this was, um, and again, as I said, I was a, a part of one of the working groups that worked on, uh, you know, the ad hoc committee that um, did the work to get this into the code, which is a pretty Herculean effort. Um, but I think a really, um, you hardly ever see this kind of major change from one code to the next. So I think this was really um, a great effort uh, by a whole lot of people. I mean, too many could possibly name, but, you know, essentially where we were capped at, um, you know, six stories and, and 85 feet. We've just sort of blown that out of the water in the new 2021 IBC. And Tanya, I'll add, I'll add and, and hopefully I'm not jumping ahead, but for, for people working in, in whatever market you're working in, Milwaukee was on 2015 IBC. So it's not like we did a cent through yes. the code, right? right. What we did uh, do is approach the city officials and we're very fortunate to have a fire department that was very knowledgeable about the science behind fire safety on mass timber, et cetera. Um, but that's still, in my opinion, especially for teams looking to push beyond uh, code, um, that's the number one step. Go and talk to the municipality. In Milwaukee, the fire department is typically not involved in decisions on uh, uh, permits, but because it was mass timber, they were. That being said, because everyone was involved early, had their input, uh, relayed their concerns, we were able to work as a team to work through that very, very quickly. And so that, that first step of getting the proper code officials involved is critical. Yeah, agree 100% with that. And for us as well, right, we are my our fire engineering group like we you know we are we're pretty much besties at this point because we don't we sort of uh we're just a tag team i mean it's almost never that we're, we're not looking at some kind of performance-based solution um either to go outside of this or perhaps you know to expose more timber than you know because a lot of people say well why would i want to do 18 stories and then cover it all up right so that's a huge huge part of the way that we come at it as well of just making sure that that's you know, an integrated approach because like you say, otherwise, you know, these these are like, it was a huge step forward, but it's also not, you know, that point I was saying earlier about the codes, you know, they're moving fast, but not fast enough. So um, it's this blend of trying to push forward on the codes, but also, you know, the, the performance-based approaches when appropriate. So I agree with that. Thanks for adding that in. And I just wanted to mention too, like a lot of times people don't like to be the first. I know Tim likes to be the first, which is awesome. <laughs> I'm going to see him blazing the way for sure. But here's some examples of other projects that are um, already kind of breaking that barrier. They, some of these are designed to the 21 IBC. Others are, again, al um, alternate means and methods going beyond. Um, right now, Woodworks is supporting 154 tall wood projects across the country. So it's 154 projects in design where folks are looking to go beyond what was in the previous code, six, seven stories max for 
with solutions. So it's exciting to see this this trend across the country. And you know, in each area, they're doing something different as to whether they're either going with the 2021 IBC or looking at the 2024 for some of the ex, um, increased exposure levels or just going pure alternate means and methods. So I thought that was kind of interesting if you wanted to see some of the other ones around the country. Yeah. Thanks for that. So Jennifer, if I can just add, so you increased exposure levels under the 2024, that's up to 12 stories though. So that, that's that's going to be a, a, a big deal, I think, for people. And, and ideally, we want to do some more um, so, uh, more testing, fire testing, because it's really new that, I, that as we go forward, we can have even more exposed. Uh, I think the safety factor is there, just that we have to be able to kind of, you know, do that testing to show it. Well, I, I would like to add something on these fire things that this uh, fire engineering is really, is, it's like wood. It, it's in, in, in its infancy, especially in the US. What we're doing is mostly prescriptive, you know, per IBC or whatever code is that. That maybe would also help us to move that part, which is not only actually to wood with anything. Sometimes it's super like conservative, Some, sometimes it's not. Like if I have a building that is no source of blameability in that, why should I add all this, uh, you know, uh, fireproofing things. So, because I think we don't know better. I mean, once this fire engineering with more analytical things, and there are actually knowledge there, all we need to push forward that and bring the fire department into it and say, look, and it is in the code, obviously. So, but we as a developer and an and, and engineer and architects that we should push forward with more that bring them into the design and they, they start looking at that specific building and say, look, this building with this condition and with this uh, function, we don't need, or we may actually need more fireproofing here, less here, and then be a little bit more scientific to that. Mm -hmm. That's, I think that's another thing that maybe would help us to that avenue also. Definitely. Well, I'm, uh, time is flying actually, I'm looking at the clock. Um, I do wanna switch for a moment, uh, switch tracks and come back to the sustainability uh, topic, because as I mentioned, we did, um, we did get a lot of questions that were submitted in advance about um, sustainability and about forests. So Kevin, I think, um, you know, if you could maybe touch on some of the key points related to sustainable forestry, the relationship between mass timber and the health of our forests. You did talk a little bit about it earlier, but, um, you know, I think just giving people a sense of, um, of what, the, what that relationship is and where we are today. Oh, sure, Jeff. So, um... The, the, um, there's a couple of studies that I think there was a, maybe a kind of a question asked about how, will mass timber, you know, lower our, um, you know, the amount of our, our forest. And it, but there was a study but done by Centrifor study that, that showed that, that uh, the impacts for mass timber will not have a, um, will not, re, you know, reduce um, the, the amount of forest that we now have. Uh, and then there's a really great website uh, and maybe you could put that into the chat, the, the, the forest carbon uh, data viz that that shows um, just how much wood we, we we harvest in the U.S. just a just a, a small fraction of, of the available um, for timber on, on different forests in the U.S. So it really isn't very much. Uh, but you know when we talk about um, sustainable forestry, it's really about forest health. Uh, in and um, most uh, most of the timber that's that's harvested in the U.S. comes from private landowners. Uh, very little from from national forest or other public forest lands, but uh, the the forest in the U.S. are are governed whether it's public lands. They're go governed by law, regulation, and policy. Um, private landowners follow state re law, regulation, and policy. All of which um, have best management practices to right. They, they're they're trying to work towards a maintain water quality. They're trying to maintain forest health, right, to reduce the risk of fire. Uh, so we, uh, as far as uh, sustainable forestry in, in the U.S., um, we, we aren't losing forests, we're actually growing forests. But one of the challenges we face is we're not doing enough management on our forests, right? That's why you're seeing the wildfires in the West, um, right? So we need, we, we, need to, we need to go in and do thinning. Uh, fire is actually a natural um, product of, of of forest, right? About every 20, 25 years, the majority of the forests require fire, but we suppress it. And that's both in the East and the West. So we need to, uh, you know, need to go in and kind of maintain our forest. You know, you know, man needs to do that, right? To, to, to thin, you know, so we, we, sounds funny, but we need to cut trees to save forests. 
Uh, and that's that's just about everywhere. So uh, I, I, mass timber is will help us um, create a long term uh, stable market. I think that can allow us to do more forest management. Yeah, I think it's it's counterintuitive to a lot of folks when they first hear it. But I think if you and there's a there is a lot of I mean, Jennifer is putting some uh, links in the chat, and there's a lot of information. I think that for people who are really interested in this question, there's actually a lot out there. Um, that if you just start doing a little bit of digging and a little bit of Googling, you can actually find quite a lot of information about what's going on um, in our forests and um, and how that, you know, what that relationship is with um, with the mass timber industry. So um, I think the, the moral of the story is that we're not, you know, we're not in danger of, of depleting our forests by building buildings out of wood. One last, so we, we, we use about 70 billion board feet of uh, timber uh, for, for housing in the U.S., um, and but mass timber will probably probably the predictions maybe five billion board feet. Um, so it's 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 it really isn't that much um, wood in the long run when you think about it. And just a quick point on the Center for study is that in that one what they looked at is by 2023 what is like a realistic max amount of mass timber and light frame buildings could we build out of wood? And this is they looked at it very like. Like this is if everyone like today started switching to mass timber and everyone, you know, instead of doing one building did four buildings or six buildings. And so they looked at this in a lot of detail, the group who studied it. And then they also compared that to, okay, what about um, in terms of forest growth, let's look at the, the most conservative amount of forest growth by 2035. And so when they compared all that in that study, you can go to the summaries, the easiest one, but if you wanna dig into the full, the full study, I put them both in the chat box there. But basically we will still by 2035 be, um, have the forest growth will still be 18% higher than the harvest volume. So still significantly more growth than what is being harvested, even in the worst case scenarios of, you know, us all of a sudden building a ton of these type of buildings um, and the forest growth being even on the conservative side. So they made sure they kind of, they looked at the worst case scenario and still 18% more growth than harvest. So check that out if you're concerned. I think it, it really helps explain. Um, and they look at it both for the entire US and then they look at it regionally as well. So that's that 18% more growth and harvest is for the entire U.S. average. Yeah. Well, and not my subject matter expertise, so Kevin and Jennifer, you can correct me, but right, it, to me, it's not just that, oh no, it's okay to use wood. It's, it's a necessity to use wood. If the majority of wood supply comes from working forests, non-federally owned, which is the case in the United States, the biggest risk to losing forest land is the conversion of forest lands to something other than forest production, which happens if you don't have demand. It is just straight up economics. So, you know, this, this argument that, oh no, like what is this gonna do to forests? It's gonna save them. It's gonna monetize them, which enables them to be kept as they are, number one. Number two, I keep hearing that the reference is to like strip, are we gonna strip our forests? There is no mass timber manufacturer I know of that's stripping forests. What we're doing is we're stripping mountains and rivers and a bunch of other natural resources for concrete and for steel. That we're doing. And there are no concrete and steel forests. So to me, this, this whole paradigm of, you know, is it sustainable? Is, is, can we handle this? Not only can we handle this, it's absolutely necessary. Final point, as a tree becomes more mature, it starts slowing down its growth cycle, which means the rate of carbon capture is slowing down. So we're actually increasing the rate of carbon capture by cutting trees down that are a little bit more mature and planting new ones. And the rate of replanting, as I'm currently understanding, is roughly two to one. So there are benefits literally across the board to increasing the utilization of wood. Yeah. And you should come work for us. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> this is for free. I don't know. This is, this is stuff I've learned in the last three years, right? But like, but to Jennifer's point, like, yes, there's a bunch of resources online. And so do the research. Yeah. Yeah. And for Tim and Reza, I mean, to what extent are sustainability goals driving your business right now? I mean, Tim, I've, I've heard you before say really, actually, it was sort of almost a cherry on top. Like it was really about an ascent. It was really more about aesthetics, actually, than about sustainability. But if, if the I think kind of understanding, like in your business, have you seen that change over the last five, 10 years, to what extent, and what do you see sort of coming in the future in terms of sustainability-driven decisions for developers? 
So I'll, I'll write the caveat is we work predominantly in multifamily. So our clients, our residents, and our funding sources are typically non-institutional. Mm -hmm. I think the conversation changes a little bit, but for us, it it's a it's a nice to have. It's something that people want to have as long as they don't have to pay more for it. Now, what we believe we've done in Ascent is definitively prove that you can build it for the same cost. There are no trade-offs. Um, but, but yes, it's again, right? Like Tesla, um, we're not doing it because it's sustainable. We're doing it because it's a better way to do things. And I believe that for the majority of market, that's what they're looking at, right? They don't want to make a sustainable, the majority of the market doesn't want to make a decision driven by sustainability if it costs more or if it's inconvenient. The great thing about mass timber is that it doesn't cost more for the most part and, um, and it's definitely not inconvenient. So you get a superior product, same price, that also happens to be sustainable. All of those things line up for, this is the perfect product. I would like to add what Tim said on the non-multifamily uh, uh, sectors. What I see is that a huge, a, a very big, uh, a drive from the big investors in the worldwide in investors toward the uh, zero carbon or embodied carbon and what's the best material here we are right right we're talking about timber and like Heinz wants to do uh, be a zero carbon embodied or emission in a few I mean I, I can't say exactly that I know the date but I can't say it here but very ambitious and and, and, and that's along with all the bigger investors and the city and the, and, and the, the, the other organization I think the biggest momentum that I see in our industry, uh, I, I mean, like commercial and other things are all these uh, big organizations that they want to capture these zero uh, carbon things in their things. And that end up to be the best material as the timber here. I see that hugely here. And Tanya, maybe I can share another slide real quick um, yeah. that just shows to give people an understanding of a study that was done that gives um, puts it in context as to what we're talking about. So this was an office structure in Denver, Colorado. It's five stories, 150,000 square feet, plot 15 project. And what we're looking at here is the um, whole building LCA that was done by the engineer on this project. And they are looking at the global warming potential. So this is kind of, you look at the entire global warming potential of the building. And so the green is um, obviously wood, the blue is, is steel and the gray is concrete. And so obviously the lower the global warming potential, the better. And you can see the cost there was almost equivalent across the board for the three systems. Yet the global warming potential when you utilized timber was a quarter of what it was with steel um, or a third of what it was with steel and then a quarter of what it was with concrete. So that just puts it into perspective for folks, I think, to what the yeah. impact is. Yeah, and, and we available if anyone wants this one. Yeah, and we're doing a lot of the same type of work early on in projects, like not rather than retrospectively trying to see, but like using these kinds of, you know, this kind of data to make decisions early on in a project. Um, you know, I work a lot with my, with our sustainability group on these kinds of analyses as well. And you're seeing that become a lot more common and in some cities even, um, you know, required, like the city of Vancouver, as an example, um, now requires all buildings applying for rezoning to uh, calculate and report their embodied carbon. So you're really starting to see, um, I think, especially at the city level, um, lots of push on this. So um, just mindful of the time and want to touch a little bit on research and development and where that's going before we kind of do a wrap up. Um, so, you know, I think there's a lot of exciting things happening in the, in the research, the R&D world when it comes to mass timber. Um, I can think of a few things that um, I'm excited to see come out, but I'm just wondering if anybody wants to, maybe Jennifer and Kevin, um, start us off of uh, kind of what you see coming down the pike in terms of R&D in this world, this mass timber world. Jennifer, you want to you talk first? Because you, you're more on the practical side. I guess just from, from our perspective, it's all sharpening the pencil. So I think that's the main point that I want to make is that, you know, this is in the codes, it is accepted, you know, these fire tests have been done. Um, you know, the one of the tests that was done um, to move forward the 2021 was, you know, five layers CLT that was burnt, it was, you know, put on fire in that apartment example um, that the Forest Service helped fund and it was like exposed to 1800 degrees and it lasted for like three hours and six minutes. I think they eventually put it out and it only needed to pass two hours. So I think it's really important that people do understand that now we're just sharpening the pencil. We're looking at, um, you know, how can we expose more? How can we, um, 
you know, address different acoustic assemblies? How can we um, look at vibration, improve vibration with different, different design details we move forward? So there's a lot of that in place. There's a lot of advancements like the rocking wall. Uh, there's gonna be a large test being done down here uh, in San Diego where we're looking at, they're, they're actually looking at a rocking wall system for um, chair wall design. So I think there's some amazing advancements that are taking place, but what's great is that like right now there's not, I mean, you can go forward, obviously, you know, Tim's built this 25 story building, um, you know, Heinz has built some amazing structures. So this is moving forward. Um, the Forest Products Lab will be hosting a workshop this fall, um, which is through the US Forest Service, and they will be looking at, like looking for input from folks. So folks that do want to see different hurdles cleared or they are running into certain problems, they'd like to see some research done or some testing. There's going to be a workshop that, you know, we'd love to have folks come to, you're invited to come and, and share or even just send in information. And there'll be researchers there that will be talking about some cutting edge research they're doing, what's next. Um, but so that's kind of, I guess I don't know if that answers your question fully, Sonia, but <laughs> that's the direction. Yeah, I, see it. yeah. I am going to that workshop and very excited for it. So perfect. Um, Can I ask you something from Jennifer? Or actually, this is more of a question or suggestion. What I would like to see actually is intermittent paint for the wood. What's okay. the research on that? I, I, if you know that. Yeah, and there's definitely groups looking into it. There's a few, we know of two different companies that have done some work in the space, um, but the workshop would be a great place to kind of see who's who's doing cutting edge work on that and, and how it's going. And, and thank, thank, so I'll add too that, so, you know, we, we, we just finished a, a fire test, right, which helped um, get the 2024 building code changed. And we're looking at potentially um, funding some additional fire tests. And I know that uh, the, uh, with, the forest product lab wants to participate in those as well um, so that we can we can continue to be able to uh, broaden that information there's there's been a lot of work jennifer talked about the rocking wall but there's there's a lot of universities looking at just other seismic uh specifically right because that that's a big concern particularly on the west coast uh, we've, we've funded some research related to that um, and, and i think that, you know uh, the forest products lab has been the you know always been focused on wood but they work with a lot of different universities um, and a lot more universities now are starting to think about uh, research around mass timber. Um, some of them are, are things that may not have an influence now, uh, but they may have an influence down the road, you know, uh, as far as its ability as an installation and how do we improve that and how do we do a lot of stuff. So I think we're only going to see a mass timber uh, improve and become a better building material as we go forward with the different things that are out there. Yeah, there's a lot of mention of fire tests. Tim, do you want to talk a little bit for a moment about the, the fire tests for Ascent? They were pretty cool. All 14 of them. Um, <laughs> so I actually have the Forest Service was kind enough to drop off, I think, nine of these. But I have one of the columns uh, that we tested. So we tested three different species. My favorite thing about this test was that um, uh, the the temperature in this test went over 2000 degrees Fahrenheit, but the temperature sensors inside the column never breached 100. So that's my, that's my fun fact. But because uh, Ascent is the recipient of a wood innovation grant from the US Forest Service, all of that data is publicly available. So people don't have to recreate the wheel. Um, you know, I, I talked to our architect, uh, Jason Corb the other day, um, and he said, you know, the, the advancements in connections um, are, so good that in in the last two years what's available is so much better than what what we spec what we could have only spec for ascent so i know that there are there's innovation all across the board um i am uh right te the technical aspect is not my strength uh what i'll tell you we're doing from a development standpoint is a things like this just right basic education and getting knowledge out knowledge out there but what we're seeing is that the real estate industry is slow to change um, that's just an inherent problem. And so um, to me, companies like Heinz are the exception rather than the rule. The big real estate development firms are typically not excited to take on a new challenge because what they're doing works and that's good enough for them. Um, Heinz is unique in that sense and that's amazing. Where we are seeing a lot of interest is from younger developers that um, have a passion for the environment and have a passion for innovation but may not be big enough, whether it's balance sheet or experience or whatever it is, to execute a larger project. And they started reaching out to us. And so we are starting to think about, all right, well, can we change our business model and become a 
partner, a joint venture, a GP to these smaller firms and help them sharpen that proverbial pencil and, and bring these projects across the finish line. Yeah, very cool. All right, well, we're just about at the top of the hour soon. So I, um, going to have us do a little bit of a wrap up. I, uh, I think we will just go around um, and maybe just about a minute each on your hope for the future of mass timber. So I'm going to go with uh, Reza first. Well, I guess my short term, I mean, I talk a lot to get this fire challenge, hopefully solve somehow to help to, you know, we can do higher uh, higher, higher rise building in Manhattan because that's a necessity based on the zoning and, and, and the commercial value of the land obviously here. But for the longer future, I, I totally agree with, with what Jennifer presented that there is a huge inventory of building between four story, uh, even, even uh, lower building like the uh, institutional things could be auditorium or whatever it is, a longer span building that could be Right now, per new per existing code, we can use the uh, timber, and we should capture that piece of market. and And I guess hopefully with that supply chain things it solve. I think we have the tools right now. And as Tim trying to say that uh, we need more developer and real estate to believe in the timber, and then kind of prove to them that not they're not losing money. Actually, they make money, and and and. and, and on top of it, that's uh, good for uh, for the uh, environment and all these things. So we, it needs more of these educational things that you guys said and are intuitive. And thank you to, to do that, to bring more actually the real estate guys that uh, they're the first the line of starting the work and then kind of trying to convince them that the timber, uh, even with the current code, we can make a big impact on the embodied carbon on the environment impact. Tim, hope for the future. Um, my hope for the future. So uh, I hope that that the supply chain is well developed, right? In the Southeast, uh, in addition to the Pacific Northwest and Northeast and even states like Wisconsin, uh, Minnesota, Michigan, um, so that we can make mass timber a, an easy commodity that is easy to get, uh, that we have uh, as many design examples of how to solve various design challenges as we currently do today with concrete and steel, right? That took decades to get here. Well, uh, that's that's what we're on the way to doing. And that creates a world. A lot of buildings are cleaner and prettier and better for us humans who spend a lot of time indoors. Yes, we do. Kevin. I would like to see mass timber become a, a part of the solution to creating uh, both workforce and affordable housing in the U.S. And, and I think there's a lot of interest in that because we we need we need more places to live, uh, and mass timber can create you know sort of a, um, an equitable social you know justice sort of place right for 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 people. Um, but I, I think we, I think we can get there um, as part of that uh, solution. Jennifer. So I like to work myself out of a job. <laughs> I'd love to see the knowledge base grow. I'd love to see like every architect and engineer have a tool in their tool belt where they can offer the service to um, a developer and an owner. I mean, I think that is where we would love to see this go. And hopefully we're, we're one step closer today. Yeah, and I would say something similar. I mean, I think that's sort of two things that I really hope I, I would really love to see Mass Timber become more a standard part of every structural engineers education, thinking, thinking from my perspective, courses and research at our universities that are on par with what we do right now for steel and concrete, right? We have a handful of really great institutions that are doing this, um, but they're still the minority for the moment. Um, and, um, you know, I think my other hope is that, you know, we will start to see sustainability as a primary driver for our decisions. Um, I've started saying to my sustainability group a lot, I work for you. Um, you know, and I think a lot of the players in our industry right now are grappling with that tension between sustainability and profitability. And so my hope for the future is that, you know, we can find some creative ways to reduce that tension so that, um, so that we can sort of uh, do both, both and. So with that, um, I just want to say a huge thank you to everybody on this panel. Um, just an amazing wealth of knowledge in this virtual 